Hello everyone, today we read and comment the fifth chapter of the second book of von Clausewitz von Krieg, the text follows. When Bonaparte in 1797, at the head of the army of Italy, advanced from the Tagliamento against the Archduke Charles, he did so with a view to force that general to a decisive action before the reinforcements expected from the Rhine had reached him. If we look only at the immediate object, the means were well chosen and justified by the result, for the Archduke was so inferior in numbers that he only made a show of resistance on the tagliamento, and when he saw his adversary so strong and resolute, yielded ground and left open the passages of the Norican Alps. Now, to what use could Bonaparte turn this fortunate event? to penetrate into the heart of the Austrian Empire itself, to facilitate the advance of the Rhine armies under Moreau and Osh, and open communication with them. This was the view taken by Bonaparte, and from this point of view he was right. But now, if, if criticism places itself at a higher point of view, namely that of the French Directory, which body could see and, ha and know that the armies of the Rhine could not commence the campaign for six weeks, then the advance of Bonaparte over the Norican Alps can only be regarded as an extremely hazardous measure. For if the Austrians had drawn largely on their Rhine armies to reinforce the army of Styria, so as to enable the Archduke to fall upon the army of Italy, not only would that army have been routed but the whole campaign lost. This consideration, which attracted the serious attention of Bonaparte at Villach, no doubt induced him to sign the armistice of Leoben with so much readiness. If criticism takes a still higher position, and if it knows that the Austrians had no reserves between the army of the Archduke Charles and Vienna, then we see that Vienna became threatened by the advance of the army of Italy. Supposing that Bonaparte knew that the capital was thus uncovered and knew that he still retained the same superiority in numbers over the Archduke as he had in Styria, then his advance against the heart of the Austrian states was no longer without purpose and its value depended on the value which the Austrians might place on preserving their capital, if that was so great that, rather than lose it, they would accept the conditions of peace which Bonaparte was ready to offer them, it became an object of the first importance to threaten the end. If Bonaparte had any reason to know this, then criticism may stop there, but if this point was only problematical, then criticism must take a still higher position and ask what would have followed if the Austrians had resolved to abandon Vienna and retire farther into the vast dominions still left to them. But it is easy to see that this question cannot be answered without bringing into consideration the probable movements of the Rhine armies on both sides. Through the decided superiority of the numbers on the side of the French, 130,000 to 80,000, there could be little doubt of the result. But then next arises the question, what use would the Directory make of a victory, whether they would follow up their success to the opposite frontiers of the Austrian monarchy, therefore to the complete breaking up or overthrow of that power, or whether they would be satisfied with the conquest of a considerable portion to serve as a security for peace? The probable result in each case must be estimated in order to come to a conclusion as to the probable determination of the Directory. Supposing, that, uh, supposing the result of these considerations to be that the French forces were much too weak for the complete subjugation of the Austrian monarchy, so that the attempt might completely uh, reverse the, uh, the respective positions of the contending armies, and that even the conquest and occupation of a considerable district of country would place the French army in strategic relations which to which they were not equal, then that result must naturally influence the estimate of the position of the army of Italy and compel it to lower uh, its expectations. And this, it was no doubt, which influenced Bonaparte, although fully aware 
of the uh, helpless condition of the Archduke still to sign the Peace of Campo Formio, which imposed no greater sacrifices on the Austrians than the loss of the provinces which, even if the, the campaign took the most favorable turn to them, they could not have reconquered. But the French could not have reconned on, uh, on even mm, the moderate Treaty of Campo Formio, and therefore it could not have been their object in making their bold advance into if, if two considerations had not presented themselves to their view. The first of which consisted in the question what degree of value the Austrians would attach to each of the above mentioned results, whether notwithstanding the probability of a satisfactory result in either of these cases, would it be worthwhile to make the sacrifices inseparable from a continuance of the war when they could be spared uh, those sacrifices by a peace on terms not too humiliating. The second consideration is the question whether the Austrian government, instead of seriously uh, weighing and the possible results of our resistance pushed to extremities, would not prove completely disheartened by the impression of their present reverses. The consideration which forms the subject of the first is no idle piece of subtle argument, but a consideration of such a decidedly practical importance that it comes up whenever the plan of pushing war to the utmost extremity is mooted, and by its weight in most cases restrains the execution of such plans. The second consideration is of equal importance, for we do not make war with an abstraction, but with a reality which we must always keep in view, and we may be sure that it was not overlooked by the bold Bonaparte, that is, that he was keenly alive to the terror which the appearance of his sword inspired. It was re a reliance on that which led him to Moscow. There it led him into, scra into a scrape. The terror of him had been weakened by the gigantic struggles in which he had been engaged. In the year 1797 it was still fresh, and the secret of a resistance pushed to the extremities had not been discovered. Nevertheless, even in 1797, his boldness might have led to a negative result if, as already said, he had not, with a sort of presentiment, avoided it by signing the moderate peace of Campo Formio. We must now bring these considerations to a close. They will suffice to show the wide sphere, the diversity and embarrassing nature of the subjects embraced in a critical examination carried to the fullest extent, that is, to those measures of a great and decisive class which must necessarily be included. It follows from uh, them that besides a theoretical acquaintance with the subject, natural talent must also have great influence on the value of critical examinations, for it rests uh, chiefly with the latter to throw the requisite light on the interrelations of things and to distinguish from amongst the endless connections of events those which are really uh, essential. But talent is also called into requisition in another way. Critical examination is not merely the appreciation of those means which have been actually employed, but also of all possible means which therefore must be suggested in the first place that these must be discovered and the use of any particular means is not fairly open to censor until uh, better is pointed out. Now, however small the number of possible combinations may be in most cases, still it must be admitted that to point out those which have not been used is not a mere analysis of actual things, but a spontaneous creation which cannot be prescribed and depends on the fertility of genius. We are far from seeing a field from great genius in a case which admits only the of the application of a few simple combinations, and we think it exceedingly ridiculous to hold up, as, it, uh, as it, uh, is, is often done, the turning of a position as an invention showing the highest genius. Still, nevertheless, this creative self-activity on the part of the critic is necessary and it is one of the points which essentially determine the value of critical examination. So this is really a beautiful historicistic passage, as you understand, as von Clausewitz in here gives us uh, a beautiful example from the uh, 1797 Italian campaign of Napoleon 
in order to show us effectively the complexity of historical analysis, right? And here everything is brought to the relatively easiest ex extremes, right? At a chiefly, uh, yeah, at an entirely strategical level, um, and yet it shows even with uh, relatively few variables that are already, you know, to to be calculated in a certain way, historically speaking, at the complexity of of options I is open uh, at every moment, right? And or better, how um, all the choices that can be taken are always uh, depending on multiple factors that are es essentially variable or to determine, right? And we don't often know that. And it's beautiful because in, in this analysis, von Clausewitz also stresses something that is rarely done um, sometimes by historians. I mean, how much the others uh, knew but also didn't know, right? Um, I mean, the protagonist um, knew or didn't know uh, relatively to their their foes, right? So von Clausewitz starts with this. Uh, when Bonaparte in 1797, at the head of the army of Italy, advanced from the Tagliamento against the Archduke Charles, he did so with a view to force the general to a decisive action before the reinforcements expected from the Rhine had reached him. Right, so here we are in the northeasternmost part of Italy, so um, uh, the, the Archduke Charles was there to, um, to control the Austrian territories uh, of northern Italy and um, is uh, brought to this final stage in which either you know, he kept resisting or he had to, to retreat. Right. And so Napoleon was naturally searching for a decisive action to wipe his army, uh, the enemy army, the Austrian army out, um, and do in doing so, especially before uh, the um, reinforcements, uh, uh, I mean the Austrian uh, reinforcements from the Rhine, where the Austrians were fighting against the main French armies, right, uh, had reached him, right. So. Naturally, in this condition, you have to realize that Napoleon had the upper hand, strategically speaking. I mean, he was to determine, at least in northern Italy, whether you know he could bring his enemy to fight um, uh, or not. I mean, there was no, not another alternative for uh, Charles to either you know meet him um, in open ground or you know in, in battle in general, or to retreat. So, von Clausewitz goes on and says, if we look only at the immediate object, uh, the means were all well uh, chosen, right, and justified by the results. So that is, you know, if we were to analyze the thing here without m other, considering other factors, yeah, that's what Napoleon was trying to do. Why? Because for the Archduke was so inferior in numbers that he only made a show of resistance on the Tagliamento, and when he saw his adversary so strong and resolute, he yelled at ground and left open the passages of the Northern Alps, right? Um, so that Napoleon had basically driven the Austrians out of Italy, right? So whichever the, the option was, naturally, you know, uh, a, a defeat would have been more profitable, but at the end of the day, uh, the objective of the French was to also overthrow uh, the Austrians from, from the region. So Archduke Charles crosses the Alps, right, and goes back to to Austria. So now, to what? Um, so von Clausewitz writes: to, to what use could Bonaparte turn his this fortunate event, right, to penetrate into the heart of the Austrian Empire itself, to facilitate the advance of the Rhine armies under Moreau and Osh, and um, open communication with them, right? So here now th it's the deal: the Austrians are dri uh, driven out of Italy. Now, what does Napoleon do, right? Does he invade Austria itself at this point? And how does this interplay with what the French are doing on the Rhine, right, uh, against the Austrians that are also uh, deployed there? Um, and and von Clausewitz writes that the latter was the view taken by Bonaparte, and from this point of view, he was right. Right, so it was good to, uh, in that specific moment, to to strain Austria from this perspective by you know attacking on the very heart of uh, you know of Austria herself, properly meant as a region, uh, 
and um, and oblige the the armies of the Rhine in part to 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 go back to Vienna and leaving the rest of the French forces on the Rhine to advance and therefore growing closer to Napoleon from Germany. So, um, but von Clausewitz admonishes us and says, but now if criticism places itself at the higher point of view, namely that of the French directory, so the French government, which body could see uh, and n know that armies on the Rhine could not commence the campaign for six weeks, then the advance of Bonaparte over the Norican Alps can only be regarded as an extremely hazardous measure. That is to say, Napoleon didn't know that the French armies on the Rhine could not com begin this uh, the invasion uh, before six weeks, wh which is a lot given that strategic situation. And therefore, if Napoleon had entered Austria, uh, you know, he would have pose himself in a fundamentally dangerous situations. Why? Because von Clausewitz writes, for if the Austrians had drawn largely on the Rhine armies to reinforce their army in Styria, right, so this region just uh, south of Austria, near south of Vienna, so as to enable the Archduke to fall upon the army of Italy, not only would that army have been routed, I mean the French one, but the whole campaign lost. Right, so this was a problem, a big problem. And von Clausewitz adds this consideration, which attracted the serious attention of Bonaparte at Villach, no doubt induced him to sign the armistice of Leoben with so much readiness. That is to say, Bonaparte realized, however, that this was really a big risk, and instead of being annihilated, making essentially the Austrians regaining uh, all what they had lost in Italy, or at least you know to to win effectively the campaign and settling the matter with, with the French government in, in the ways we, we can think of um, this decided to say okay let's make the, uh, this armistice and and uh, the hostility at, at this point given that objectively a great deal had been accomplished in Italy in the first place then von Clausewitz adds so um, basically as you ever understood also from the previous reading von Clausewitz here goes at several different levels of the analysis. It says, okay, if we consider all these, uh, you know, factors individually and we combine them and we can basically arise by adding yet another condition and therefore enlarging in a certain sense, and pers broadening the perspective and rising in, in the quality of criticism, right? Let's contextualize it and say this at the beginning because I assume that you're following the series since the uh, the be uh, if not since the beginning, at least you know from the previous videos. So here, von Clausewitz is showing us how the the, the validity, I mean the the complication, uh, aside from just the validity, of course, of the mm, criticism when you have to determine in 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 a military analysis what might have not just what actually happened to assess that but also what was possible in practice to happen and, and what can we learn f for the uh, at the benefit of the theory of the art of war so he states if criticism takes a still higher position and if it knows that the austrians had no reserves between the army of the arch of the archduke charles and vienna then we see that Vienna became threatened by the advance of the army of Italy. So this is a big deal because actually the Austrians were in dire straits now. Um, they uh, they lacked effectively a consistent force to oppose now the French uh, uh, invading from Italy. So um, this changes a big deal uh, in in the computation of the motivations in here. Then von Clausewitz goes on and writes, supposing that Bonaparte knew that the capital was thus uncovered and knew that he still retained the same superiority numbers over the Archduke as he had in Styria, then his advance against the heart of the Austrian states was no longer without purpose and its value depended on the value which the Austrians might place on preserving their capital. So in other words, Okay, yes, now Vienna is um, without protection, almost, and 
fundamentally this can be over overwhelmed. So now the point is how much are the Austrians uh, you know, in counting on on their capital and how this can affect their continuation of the struggle, right? And von Clausewitz writes, he presents the two other options. If that was so great that rather than to then lose it, they would accept the conditions of peace which Bonaparte was ready to offer them, it became an object of the first importance to threaten Vienna. And if Bonaparte had any reason to know this, then criticism may stop there. But if this point was only pr problematical, then criticism must take a still higher position and ask what would have followed if the Austrians had resolved to abandon Vienna and retire farther into the vast dominions still left to them. In other words, a bit like the Russians did, for example, in 1812. So this is, this is also very, very important. So these are just theoretical options, right? So this is what von Clausewitz is teaching us, right? Considering fundamentally what are the variables included in this computation. And, and this is brutally simplified, right? It's not that simple. Or at least it's in turn a set of, um, you know, it derives from a set of other circumstances that are not easy to calculate altogether, right? And we try to reason in terms of yes or no, but the thing can even change over time. Or depends on many other factors and can change at the same time. Um, so, and in fact, von Clausewitz says, but it's, I it is easy to see that this question cannot be answered without bringing into consideration the probable movements of the Rhine armies on both sides. Right? So, once again, the other factor we were ignoring, excluding temporarily, was there was, there was still an Austrian ar army on the Rhine that could intervene. And this could influence a big deal, both the contenders. Um, uh, von Clausewitz writes, through the decided superiority of numbers on the side of the French, 130,000 to 80,000, there could be little doubt of the result. But then, next arises the question, what use would the directory make of a victory? Whether they would follow up their success to the opposite frontiers of the Austrian monarchy, therefore to the complete breaking up or overthrow of that power, or whether they would be satisfied with the conquest of a considerable portion to serve as a security for peace. Now it's a big deal, and this is the uh, most exemplary uh, uh, point so far that d that shows uh, the that war is nothing but a political act, and more specifically, a continuation of politics by other means. Now you you can't crush, you can't uh, advance, let's say, in deep into into Austria and see what happens and bring it to, to a next stage but the, the whole point of this all is wh what is that you want to do as the directory as France as a wall right what does you know uh, Britain has to say for example or, you know wh wh what's the hell is going on even within France right you can't say now we have just win the game right this is not a video game this is a serious political and social uh, system that you have to you know to balance in a way that is profitable to you so not necessarily as we will see now the um, the uh, unlikely by the way crashing of the Austrian monarchy at that point would have mm, favored the French even in somewhat in the immediate moment because um, von Clausewitz answers, the, the probable result in, in each case must be estimated in order to come to a conclusion as to the probable determination of the directory. So, supposing the result of these considerations to be that the French forces were uh, much too weak for, for the complete subjugation of the Austrian monarchy, so that the attempt might completely reverse the respective positions of the contending armies, and that even the conquest and occupation of a considerable district of country would place the French army in, a, in strategic relations to which they were not equal, then that result must naturally influence the estimate of the position of the army of Italy and compel it to lower its expectations. Right? So there could be 
uh, in this sense to to situations. First of all, even the advance of the army of Italy in the army of the Rhine, uh, conjoint, let's say, didn't mean by that point that the Austrians could be annihilated in the first place, um, because as we've seen, they could have even maybe lost Vienna, but still they might have retreated uh, in their vast, the rest of their vast dominions collected under army, and they would have regained momentum. But also, were the French to effectively defeat the Austrians and, let's say, seize uh, a part of their dominions, would have that been strategically advantageous? And would, especially the, the, the armed forces of France at that point, would be in a situation that, that was advantageous to them? I mean, mm, securing those territories, for example, occupying them would have been um, in, in the whole uh, international scenario uh, um, useful thing you know would wouldn't these troops be committed for example to to uh, the occupation of a land that m politically or socially would have not supported the French would have obliged them to uh, you know to mm, commit troops and distracting them from other important fronts uh, that would have uh, eventually opened so this is a very big deal and von Clausewitz says, and this, it was no doubt which influenced Bonaparte, although fully aware of the helpless condition of the Archduke still to sign the peace of Campo Formi, which imposed no greater sacrifices on the Austrians than the loss of provinces, which even if the campaign took the most favorable, favorable turn to, uh, for them, they could have not uh, reconquered, right? Because at that point, realistically, before before we imagine the possible total annihilation of the army of Italy itself, might have led to different outcome. But here, now the French had driven out the Austrians from Italy, so um, th there wasn't much. Th there was more to risk. This is what N Napoleon realized by uh, with an invasion of Austria than just maintaining what the French had gained, right? And prudence essentially brought the French to secure the peace with the Austrians at Campo Formi, right? So the Austrians, after all, had lost their territories. So even for them, now they had an option, evidently, even to continue on fighting. That's what von Clausewitz eventually takes in consideration. But it's uh, very important to see how uh, even the French at that point realized that pushing forward was not necessarily the best option, even if uh, at an immediate level maybe they could have accomplished as much as marching on Vienna. Right? This is th the, the picture that emerges you know, uh, almost as a game, but war is effectively a game. Um, it has the, the characteristics of it. But um, so the um, von Clausewitz says uh, yet again, but the French could not have reconned on even the moderate Treaty of Campo Formio, and therefore it could have not have been their object in making their bold advance if two considerations had not presented themselves in their view, the first of which consisted in the question what degree of value the Austrians would attach to each of the above mentioned results. Right, were the Austrians to continue to struggle or not? Right, and he writes whether, notwithstanding the probability of a satisfactory result in either of these cases, would it be worthwhile to make the sacrifices uh, inseparable from a continuance of the war when they could be spared those sacrifices by a peace in terms not too humiliating? Right, this is what happened, but there was also another option. And the second con consideration, in fact, is the question whether the Austrian government, instead of seriously weighing the possible results of a resistance pushed to extre uh, extremities, would not prove completely disheartened by the impression of their pr present reverses. Right, this is also a moral problem. Right, there is always, um, you know, in von Clausewitz's comments, that the consideration which forms the the subject of the first is not idle piece of subtle argument but a consideration of such decidedly practical importance that it comes up whether the plan of pushing war to the utmost extremity is mooted and by its weight in most cases restrains the, execu the executions of such plans. That is to say, you have always to take in consideration that here 
there's a political goal in the end. So you, I mean, war doesn't continue forever, but there is always a, a choice here. That is, we let's continue this to to the ultimate, to towards the extreme, like fighting to the death, basically to annihilation, or do we, you know, take into consideration the idea of stopping it for a while? Because that, and von Clausewitz says this is not a banal point, right, to follow, because there are also certain, um, you know, moral matters involved. In fact, he writes that about the second case, that the second consideration is of equal importance, for we do not make war with an abstraction, but with a reality, which must always keep in view, and we may be sure that it, is, it was not overlooked by the bold Bo Bonaparte, that is, that he was keenly alive to the terror which the appearance of his world inspired. Right? Uh, here, in as well, in fact, Napoleon was a young general, right? He had obtained his first successes. Uh, the, the campaign of Italy is, you know, the, 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 the most seriously important one, right? Uh, at, at a, a high level. Um, and yet, he was not the Napoleon, say, of twelve, uh, of 1812, right? Um, it was reliance on that which led him to Moscow. That is to say, the Napoleon 1797, it was differently uh, evaluated also by the enemy, but not and not only, uh, look at the directory, uh, then the one of tw 1812, when he actually was emperor by that point. Um, so, this is to be considered, um, because von Clausewitz says there it led him into a scrape, right, and it's paradoxical also because, yeah, that was a sort of push towards the extreme, right, was the realization, according to Napoleon, that Russia could be um, bent just with uh, a war really brought to the extremes, in fact, marching on Moscow, right, and I'm one of those people that objectively I think, at least, I hope at least recognizes that, ah, Napoleon, you know, and all those people saying, ah, Napoleon made a mistake, they didn't, ha they didn't have to uh, invade Russia, but th that was literally the single uh, unique and only thing to do at some point, right? The continental bloc was failing, uh, Russia was keeping to, to, to expand in that regard, so uh, and risking the whole thing to collapse, so it actually was uh, it was not an option more than much. So all this tragedy of the the tyrant that wanted too much and uh, that he went to Moscow eventually, it's it's very moralistic in in. But if you look at the, the political reality of the time, there wasn't much else to do, for real. Um, and. Um, and yes, is, uh, and, and von Klausik goes on, the terror of him had been weakened by the gigantic struggles in which he had been engaged. In the year 1797, it was still fresh, and the secret of resistance pushed to the extremities had not been discovered. Right? So it was still uh, even a, a different type of war that was being fought in 1797. Uh, in, you know, with a different mindset, with a different scale, if you want, or even a destruction of a power and of uh, on a different scale of political goals as well um, and for close it says nevertheless even in 1797 his boldness might have led to a negative result if as already said he had not with a sort of presentiment avoided it by signing the moderate peace of Campo Formio. that is to say that the Napoleon that marched on Moscow was uh, already existing in, uh, in neutral let's say in the Napoleon of 1797, probably, but a matter of personality, of character, whatever. But just for saying that, the um, also in here, it's really a matter of individual decisions, sometimes not just a matter of mere mechanisms. There are people at the top, n Napoleon, n no one else, you could argue, but Napoleon or someone that comes so rarely, like him, in, in history and, and that is lucky and capable to find himself in the right circumstances and exploiting them could have won the campaign of Italy because objectively you know that sent them there him there saying okay well let's get rid of him you know he conquers the wolf freaking uh, you know 
northern Italy, and and that's a an important side of the story because um, that also shows you how um, certain characters also are fundamentally unpredictable to to arise. And like we did know Napoleon for he he really was right, and how many other I mean, before this time, and how many other great generals have remained uh, in conditions in which they couldn't express fundamentally their their genius, right? Then von Clausewitz uh, reflects on this whole thing now, because he says, we must now bring these considerations to a close, right? They will suffice to show the wide sphere, the diversity and embarrassing nature of the subjects embraced in a critical examination, carried to the fullest extent, it is to those measures of a great and decisive class which must necessarily be included, right? So this uh, example of the 1797 campaign of Italy by Napoleon is definitely uh, a very good um, picture and you know an object of inquiry that shows you how. Um, how untrained we generally are, I think, in today's world, um, at a popular level, to consider the complexity of warfare in its entirety. That is to say, instead of focusing on the broader picture and realizing at that and having the capacity at that point of naturally a great synthesis capability and uh, critical observation, we tend to focus on the tiny things, right? Uh, how many people today, seriously, are, for example, impressed by the fact that now in war we use drones, for example? I mean, seriously, there's plenty of people who find this disconcerting, right? They think about, ah, now you can kill someone with a click, li uh, like in a video game, uh, warfare has changed, Th this is going to be bad, right? So, this w knows which political uh, influences this will f this thing will have. And then eventually everybody ignores, I mean, wha what's going on in the world between, you know, powers like the United States and China and Russia and Iran by the slightest, or at least l looking at the thing as, it, uh, uh, as if it was a risk, essentially, and all what lays in the within, that is the cream and the essence and, 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 and the wealth, and the, the precious material of every strategical analysis, goes lost, because in between there is not strategic culture, education, uh, to, su to substantiate it in the mindset of an average person that votes right and that's and has influences on how uh, things are going to go right and it seems to me especially i mean that this um, detachment from the masses and even our political and military uh, action as uh, as states a single state or as coalitions as well uh, is astonishing right in this historical period especially is astonishing like we have been probably by a certain I, I mean I don't see in any country at this point if not maybe uh, maybe just one or uh, I don't uh, in this context that it's not important to discuss it but let's say to I mean the, the this even institutional need to educate people about things that also if they were understood that would actually restore more confidence in our um, in our governments or at least in the capacities that we have and how we should act in that way and intervening uh, with a healthy political debate in how we should use our military instrument that is not just to bomb right randomly um, uh, our our competitors. That is to say, also to have a strategic culture in order to reshape our militaries or to you know shape a new doctrine, having uh, a new strategy, a new vision of who we are and we should be in the world. This is a massive problem. I must say, in in Europe, especially right now, we have a, a great serious problem. Um, that is, as always, primarily a political and also social one, but that from the military point of view reflects the complete, almost complete uh, ignorance of 
you know, the, the reality is that most people who get interested in the military are just, you know, like, once again, um, leaving it as if they were back in a football team that bears their flag, not effectively understanding much aside from this sort of um, obsession about leading, uh, you know, uh, bodybuilding lifestyle <laughs> or having this kind of aggressive look that is associated to a sort of tribal culture and, you know, nothing else in terms of actual political, democratic or civic education. I mean, some people have. I must say that, fortunately, we live also in a world in which if you want to find some point of reference, there are people who are seriously interested in political and military affairs and uh, understand their importance, but at the same time, uh, it's very, very difficult to find someone who has a modernly comprehensive strategic uh, education and fundamentally uh, is able to look at the thing also from a non, um, in, in a really critical way, right? Not just in a from a specialistic perspective, for example, uh, even if the if it were even a matter of strategic analysis, because as we have seen, a lot of times you don't you can't build a strategic culture, um, being a strategic analyst as we're probably having too many at least self claiming to be that have not even a solid military historical education, right? It's very difficult to to find the material to um, really have a, a fluid vision of what reality is. For not taking talking about politics, sheer politics that is going really off the board. I mean, okay, let, let's not start talking about this, but uh, that's a problem for everybody. Basically, I can't see uh, even in politics uh, a side that takes minimal in consideration the. This is a problem of the Western world as a whole, right? The the other peoples, unfortunately, out there, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't know. They they have a pretty uh, you know fantasy uh, vision of what's happening, what their governments are doing, what they're not doing. In the West, we have actually all the uh, the means available, and the worst is that, and we have also a particular role in the world that we totally uh, overlook that we don't give a damn about, right? That's the thing, that the same goes for history a little bit, right? We have a spit blood for millennia to, to, to have uh, ac access to knowledge, right? It was a, a luxury stuff up to a few generations ago. Now we have literally everything a click away from us. Nobody can complain about that. And nobody actually studies or cares about and takes uh, information more as a, as a form of entertainment, and even wants it as a form of entertainment than actually uh, being a serious mean of, you know, uh, intellectual growth and, uh, you know, critical uh, improvement, etc. So, um, a, a fewer and fewer people like to be challenged. That's another. That's another problem, right? It's valid for everyone, right? Um, but um, examples like it. That's why reading from Clausewitz, I think, is so fundamental because, of course, I, I doubt that if that average person who read this passage would, I mean, it's obvious, it wouldn't uh, have not such a great meaning for that person. But at least if the person read it and understood it at, at its fullest, would realize that objectively there are, for example, different levels of. Um, historical inquiry of of analysis of such military events so that the thing is not banally uh, you know what kind of army you have or you know how uh, the the you know the, the that specific sector theater evolves right it's constantly about what the hell is happening in your in the political in the polity that is employing that that uh, that military instrument and its society, right, and and also lots of other polities that are interacting together. So that's what challenges you because it, it's very difficult. Like I'm not telling you now you should all start studying from Clausewitz and you will magically get by yourself a strategic culture, but that this should be like the base without which you can't really go much further, right? And then if you were to to grow expert about specific scenarios should spend years and years of your life I mean with serious professional studying about that I don't know that war um, that, that that conflict in general 
and uh, which is difficult and obviously most people can can do but at least the the experts those who have the specific competence could uh, could use it to at least make others aware that this dimension exists and, and that is probably one of the most important in our cultures now I don't want to be catastrophistic but I think that with coronavirus and uh, the world will change uh, much from a political and social point of view it has already done right and these are not changes that you can reverse there will not be a time in which we will come back in the way we were before right forget about this be aware that um, socially speaking we will see very bad things politically speaking everything will get pretty much uh, more uh, in part fluid or at least it will change in ways that are difficult to predict and that can also go and probably want it but uh, I don't want to be pessimistic even though it's a way to be right you know at the end uh, most of the times um, but even in there the all these things will oblige us to reacquire some sort to acquire from scratch most of the times some amount of strategic culture because these things will are literally the ABC like in fact politics war and and society are literally the ABC of our uh, of our world as human beings and um, to pretend it exists else as a distraction that you can focus in while the rest is happening is is a recipe from from disaster we we have been lucky to have lived for a couple of generations or more or three maybe um, in a in a world that could give you a lot that you know f it was fairly stable and um, and also improving right and leaving us with getting us to to certain levels of quality of life that are unprecedented in the history of the world um, in the early 2000s poverty has sunk uh, f beautifully um, from great in, you know I mean all over the world at in massive rates right and we we are fortunate enough even to be d to deal with with crisis and at this point with a very robust amount of of advantages but um, this has softened us up right we have grown in in the conviction that you know life is about a few things it's just about getting your job your money and it, your family that's it right but there is much more than that and if you just look at history and and what it is and this kind of isolation uh, isolationistic perspective let's say that say okay I just care about those things and I don't care about politics because I don't really it's not really a healthy way or an intelligent way or um, even a you know advantageous way in the first place to deal with what will come right and so um, it's it's difficult because these problems eventually arise chiefly from a from a collective point of view that is to say that entire countries entire peoples eventually get to uh, the meat grinder crisis without an adequate um, uh, you know uh, equipment right from a especially from a politically cultural point of view but once again we will have forcefully to get to face this once again uh, in my videos even previously to coronavirus I, I I tended to say that we are in a crisis already, right? We are just not seeing it, right? We have our the, the basis of our world are are fundamentally weak. We're not used to to a crisis. We we wouldn't have the means to to cope with one. Well, it seems what happened in the last months has showed it pretty pretty well. Unfortunately, I mean, I am the first one that <laughs> wishes that this was not the case but uh, so it is and and this whole thing is confirming a lot of aspects of our world that is grown totally dysfunctional that um, that peace and democracy stability are not uh, intrinsic to our culture that um, uh, and this is in fact uh, perfectly confirming what von Clausewitz says and that we have built a sort of culturalist um, delusion for which you know things have always to go well and that just uh, 
evil people resort, I don't know, to, to violence or that, uh, you know, we should be uh, just somewhat passive into to certain things we happen because, you know, tolerance is better than, um, you know, than, than a firm action. We have sensibly weakened, weakened us. We have created um, uh, political and social constructions that are precariously uh, stable and that now will probably crumble in consistent parts of it because this thing cannot satisfy, I mean, this current conditions cannot sat satisfy everybody and people will will um, uh, will fight for this in a way we, we are already doing it but aside from this this is only another uh, you know uh, matter but uh, I, I believe von Clausewitz here is, is speaking to us directly because he's showing us how the the problem is uh, is recurring right and how if you lack this even this simple uh, cultural instruments, this simple vision of of, of a simplified uh, strategic scenario of things you can't, you nor uh, normally people study all about in school, how can you have uh, of, you know, international policy, right, objectively, right, because it's a very sad thing. We are contending us with always a smaller, uh, cheaper, faster, uh, ways of framing reality that do not help us at all, right? You can uh, use them as economic products to um, to be bought by the literates, but that's not how you are going to solve the problem practically. Hence, we need oh. this form of education. Um, so, von Clausewitz says, however, just to conclude, we must now bring these considerations at a... Uh, okay, we have already read it, right? Uh, then he says, it follows from them that besides the theoretical acquaintance with the subject, natural talent must also have a great influence on the value of critical examinations, for it rests chiefly with the latter to throw the requisite light on the alterations of things and to distinguish from amongst the endless connections of events those which are really essential. Right. So he's telling us, you know, concisely, that uh, we have seen how even something that is brought to simple to a simple level, right, is still um, connected to uh, an endless series of factors that maybe they're not essentials, but altogether uh, are needed to form the uh, even this the simple principles that we are talking about. Um, that is not to say. Uh, I mean, history should be, uh, it's not really a historical problem, this is a decisional problem. That is to say, yes, you can't even know what Napoleon did in the circumstances, but the point is, have you really thought of what the point of this all was, right, of, of all these various thinking and um, and, and all these various, uh, various options were? Because the, the normal thing is, is the story of it, right? Napoleon did this and did that, and eventually the war ended, okay, end of story. But what happened in the meanwhile was, really, what the hell is going to happen now? And how do we decide that, and how did history went that way? Right, that's the, the difference between the cheap and superficial interpretations and what truly matters there, because you, one day you may not be the person who was reading that from a history book, but for, you know, the commander was dealing with that in the first place, I mean, you know, this is maybe hyperbolic, but just to make you understand that, um, uh, I mean, here we're not talking about Napoleon just as a random guy, right? Here, that aside from the most direct um, people that depended on him uh, as soldiers, as troopers, and uh, but think about all the people who, you know, suffered the devastations of this war and that paid for, for the army at home, right? And that's something that really has to do with all of us. Um, then, from Cla uh, so it's right, uh, but talent is also called into requisition in another way. Critical examination is not merely the appreciation of those means which have been actually employed, but also of all possible means, which therefore must be suggested in the first place, that is, must be discovered. 
and the use of any particular means is not fairly open to censor until a better is pointed out. Right? This is very important. Uh, that is to say, not only you have to think of what was eventually uh, done in history, it's another way of saying what we said before, just referred to the, the actual means that in this case were you know, the armed forces on a strategical scenario, um, but also the ones that could possibly come into, into action. Remember where we were thinking just about Napoleon and the Archduke uh, Charles? Well, there was the whole freaking Rhine uh, theater that had to be taken in consideration. And that shows you how you must continuously connect all the various options here. And in, in word, this thing can change dramatically fast. Right? This was, again, was very, very brutally uh, simplified for a didactic purpose. Right? And also, uh, von Clausewitz stresses here that um, there is no, um, let's say, no decision that basically is not subjected to, um, to criticism in the sense that um, we should always stay very open to what also could have not uh, uh, could have taken place that is not being done right not because that was necessarily maybe there is always a better option right but rather for um, dimensioning better the option that has been taken here right because it's, it was fairly um, you know after all as von Clausewitz himself says things in war are pretty simple right but it's sim it's usually the simplest things that are the hardest, right? These were bitterly fought campaigns, and they were not a promenade, right? So, uh, whichever choice was on the table here must ta be taken into consideration, historically speaking, because that could make an enormous difference. Um, and von Clausewitz adds, now, however small the number of possible combinations may be in most cases, Right. Still, it must be admitted that to point out those which have not been used is, a, is not a mere analysis of actual things, but a spontaneous creation which cannot be prescribed and depends on the fertility of genius. That is to say that um, there is a difference between what you can, um, let's say, hypothesize uh, at all times, which is infinitely uh, not infinitely important, but infinitely, um, you know, long, right? If you were to assert and with a certain degree of, of security everything, but there is also a hierarchy of things that are more or less important. But it's, and the, the military genius, right, that is able to read through that mess by finding, let's say, more effectively and also quick, more quickly, the right answer. That is to say, once again, uh, when you're in command, it's not that you can wait forever, right? Um, and while you're a historian, you can't even spend an entire life studying something. And an entire life has passed right, in the meanwhile. So that's where also this uh, capacity that y you can't really prescript to spot the, the best solution, right? You can't, there is a theory that you can follow, as we've seen, but in every single situation there is so much that can be um, really uh, experimented that is worth being analyzed that I the whole complexity of reality uh, it's it's remarkable in the first place to to be able to spot so quickly right so you can have experienced talent genius um, and the point though is that um, from a historical point of view especially um, but even you know in the actual moment of command actually um, things can vary wildly not just in reality but in our perception of reality that is to say what the hell do we know how it how the thing was in the first place right you know that's also what historical inquiry can can definitely uh, look at better, but um, it's still a matter of somewhat of a vision of the genius that is, you know, capable of even taking a d decision. It is not just an option that you 
lighten up and it's either right or wrong but it's a sort of you know it, it, it entails even the moral forces the the determination of pursuing on uh, on a path that maybe it's not the best one but it still made you win because maybe your your foe was weaker morally speaking right so you have always to stay open to an infinite dimensional uh, reality of warfare that is not frameable it's not explainable through through any pattern um, other than a theoretical one that that you can confront uh, statistically with your current reality but it, but a reality that you still have to sort out largely from scratch and, and especially by yourself right so this is really a big deal and that's how complicated it is and that's what it means to have a strategic culture I mean to be confronted constantly with such serious um, problems in the mm, in the mathematical sense of the word, right? It's not merely uh, a matter of, uh, as we were saying before, of uh, of set of options, of prepared options. Is it literally you have to build those options and to test them and to change that and to uh, continually deal with lots of things that are coming at you and that you 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 can be blinded by. And it, it's very very fascinating if you think about it because we are attracted by problems after all so that's also why I think warfare is so fascinating so many people actually like war even if they don't have much of you know a great strategic culture because it's it, it, it leaves you however that o that um, room for reflection that is what eventually strategic culture stems from then von Clausewitz concludes definitely with this other uh, period by saying we are far from seeing a field for um, for great genius in a case which admits only of the application of a few simple combinations, and we think it exceedingly ridiculous to hold up as if uh, as I is often done the turning of a position as an invention showing the highest genius. Still, nevertheless, this creative self-activity on the part of critic is necessary, and it is one of the points which essentially determines uh, determine the value of critical examination all right this is uh, very important as well um, um, that is mm, to say that you can't identify the genius in a single action right this is the the meaning of this phrase you can't think that a single maneuver or a certain choice by itself identifies who knows which great genius because as paradoxically the, the genius knows better than anybody is that there is no um, positivistic connection between success and um, you know um, complete um, calculation of reality like many people say okay but there are certain things to do uh, militarily speaking that objectively cannot do be done by chance right um, yes, but that still doesn't mean that um, you can be very, very lucky to achieve a result, for example. Even if you have given literally your best, right? So not everything is it comes from a mistake or from a, uh, you know, a positivistically inquire, um, you know, the decipherable set of information. You may lose because simply uh, you, you couldn't control what... And this naturally also places uh, the attention poses the attention to to the responsibility involved that is to say war is always something very risky right you can there is no other way to fight it but I in that way right in uh, taking the challenge you but you always have to know in that regard that it is a risk right and that there is no um, clear um, I mean foretelling what w it will be right and and that's where the talent is in the genius is um, to be um, uh, you know uh, regarded as the most important thing because it's really a person that is competent along the way that cannot tell you what will happen but may have more intuition than others and therefore allowing you to succeed after all so it's it's complex right but at the same time it's 
it's um, it's it's more simple than what most people think that the world deal of warfare is explainable by why right the the reality of of a certain military situation is is that o overwhelmingly complicated but the guidelines in this regard of how you have to approach warfare are after all very simple and you perfectly know that part of them that you know th that you know there is uh, that this simplicity is is not a weakness but it's a, a strength on the contrary because if you know that really this th there is no um, final uh, resolution like that there is no uh, certain solution let's say better uh, you um, are already aware that that's the reality and you have somewhat an edge over those who think that you have that have to do the most complicated things to, to sort out the most elaborated and sophisticated responses because those most of the times do not hold at the first contact with the enemy that that's the real problem but anyhow um, let's stop it here for today um, so we will go on with actually other examples yes um, historical examples I mean so for now just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye